Hey everybody, this is Mike with the One Stop Co-op Shop, and we are going to post-apocalyptic Australia. All those Mad Max fans out there should be happy. We're looking at Waste Nights. Quick disclaimer, I did get a review copy of this one, and I looked into it based on some recommendations from some of our Discord members, so thanks guys. Waste Nights is a solo and cooperative adventure game, like I said, set in a post-apocalyptic hellscape. And your characters can play through several one-off scenarios. What I'm going to show you here is one of the two solo-only tutorial scenarios. And these are one-off games, no campaign here, although you level up a lot during the game, as you'll see. And like always, we'll do a quick overview of the game and then jump into a full solo playthrough. But if you want to see my full review on the game, check our separate video that posted at the same time as this playthrough. And if you like what you see here on the One Stop Co-op Shop, please subscribe to the channel. Consider supporting us through Patreon for early access to our videos, picking which games we cover, other cool perks. Also check out our separate streaming channel, our weekly podcast, or join the Discord and you can suggest games to me too. So each scenario in Waste Night is highly different. In the tutorial's case, it's really pretty straightforward. My character is going to be going along the southern coast. There's two solo tutorials, one going along the north, one along the south. And I'm going to try to reach these little plot points here, basically to progress the story. So this is very much a race. <laughs> Most scenarios give you more time to kind of stretch your legs. This one just pushes you to the finish. And the round structure in Waste Night is incredibly simple. You just take two actions for your character. You can't do the same action twice, and that's the end of a round. And the actions are pretty easy to understand. Moving, camping, exploring, uh, shopping at the city, forwarding the plot, other special stuff. We'll see the details as we play, because it's really a pretty straightforward game. And we have a couple books we're going to refer to. First of all, the guide has the details for our scenario. We're doing Trouble in the South. The Wild North is the other solo tutorial one. And then additionally, we've got the Book of Tales. And indeed it is. Oh my gosh, somebody wrote all of this. <laughs> So get ready for some mic narration and mood music in the playthrough. We've got this time marker starting on the two space. And every round except for the first at the start of the round, it's going to dip down one. If it gets to zero, we lose. But each time my character reaches one of these plot points and takes a plot action in that space, the time marker is going to advance two spaces up. So basically it's a race for me to get enough plot points without taking too much time and running out. Now separately we've got this blue marker on the five space, and this is marking the dominance of the factions. There's two main factions here. There's the Free Mutants in the west, and there's the Merchant Cartel in the east. A higher value means the cartel is dominant, a lower value means the Free Mutants are. <laughs> Very uh, Fallout-like for those of you who played New Vegas or those kind of games. And let's look at who I'm controlling in the play. In this case, it's Zoe Shaw, the mechanic, and I've given her a bike. You can pick your ride in this game. I went for something fast because, again, this is a race scenario. And Zoe is a mechanic, although with that big gun and that flamer in her other hand, what is she, a mechanic of death? Guess so. So because of my character, I had the choice between a uh, gun and knife and some armor or a sawn-off shotgun and a vest. And Zoe is better at range attack. You'll see Blade, Survival Aid, Gun, Negotiate, Tech. These are used for tests in the game. White dice are the weakest and green are stronger. So she's very good at tech, pretty good at guns and negotiating, pretty crud at Blade, Survival, and Aid. She also has a health value, exploration, a repair value, an experience marker on zero. She's starting with three ammo and some medicine. But we'll get into the details of all of that as we play the game and it comes up. But let's jump into some flavor text and see how Zoe's going to fare in this post-apocalypse. Full mobilization! To arms, New Sydney dwellers, to arms! You can see such posters all over the city. Local leaders must be preparing for some conflict. Such a commotion can only mean one thing. Expansion to the west. Streets are already full of bikers, armed to the teeth and eager to pick a fight, claiming that they work for the Merchant Cartel, a powerful association of traders from the east coast. This mass levy means trouble. If such a massive brute force isn't quickly directed at some enemy, the city will turn into a war zone. For now, the newcomers are kept in check, but with each passing day, more and more volunteers for the mercenary militia arrive to New Sydney. On top of that, there are rumors about talks between the self-appointed Free Mutants League from distant Carcassville and the filthy Corsairs from the port city of Alice Offsprings. Are they going to form an alliance and threaten the lands east of the Great Divide? It seems both them and the New Sydney merchants are ready for open war and now looking for means to finally settle who rules the South. When you bolted the Golden Lap badge to your car, you had no idea that the small piece of your ride would mean more than dirt and dents on its bodywork or scars on your face. 
Uh, I skipped this narrative, but at the very beginning of the book, it said people who had done the Golden Lap had driven around the entirety of Australia, even in the uh, danger of this post-apocalypse. Thanks to this reputation, your repair skills quickly came to be appreciated, and you found a sponsor to help you set up a workshop in New Sydney. It was the Merchant Cartel. However, your dream about a peaceful life soon proved to be a nightmare. You became a small cog in the machine, grinding all the wretched souls and unlucky survivors who came to the city. You had to fix stuff for choice clients for low pay, 15 hour long workdays, tons of paperwork to justify parts expenses. You knew this was not a life for you. In one of the local joints favored by mechanics and bikers, you heard a rumor about miners' unions forming in the north. God knows when you ended up at a meeting of idealists making plans to promote a similar initiative in New Sydney. A few days later, your workshop got burnt down and your sponsors put you in a tight spot. In order to pay your debts to the cartel, you have to travel the road to ruin once again to spy upon the mutant forces threatening the traders' domination in the south. So with the initial narrative and our character setup out of the way, let's get to the gameplay. As I mentioned, you get two actions per turn and you can't take the same type. And the first one I'm going to show you here is the move action. So as you can see, the map is divided into hexes. And there are several different terrain types. We've got highway, which note costs zero movement points to move on to. Desert, which costs one. Scrub and mountains that cost two. And craters we can't move into at all. Cities will indicate which terrain they're built on. And when you take the move action, you look at your chosen vehicle. In this case, my bike has five moves, so that's how many movement points I have to spend. And then additionally, you start with two gas in your tank. My bike can't hold any more than that. But if I want to move further than five movement points, I can spend one gas to get an extra three. Remember, this thing is a race, so I definitely want to go as quickly as I can. Although it looks pretty easy, so that's zero, zero, zero. Uh, two for the mountain and two for the scrub, so even with a one movement point left, I can already reach my destination. Now, like a lot of these adventure games at Arkham Horror and such, you have an encounter, but in this game it only happens when you finish movement. Now, the first thing you check is whether you went over any yellow little danger symbols on the board. In this case, I did this exclamation point. Exclamation points, which stand for threat, means I'm going to draw a threat token from the bag. For each of these sort of hazardous material symbols, I get a contaminated wound, a one out of the seven it would take to make me unconscious. And for each of the radiation symbols, I get one radiation level. If you get uh, more and more of those, it really messes you up. In this case, though, I'm just getting one threat token from this uh, space out of New Sydney. So we look, it's got one damage on the yellow side and two damage on the red side. What does that mean? The yellow and red refers to what kind of encounter I'm going to have. Red will modify an enemy encounter and yellow anything else. And there's two encounter decks, one for Scrub and Mountain, one for Desert and Road. And in this case, I'm getting attacked by a Scrub Python just a jumping on me. And so because of that, we're going to resolve the red effect, which almost always is triggered by the enemy attack. It kind of becomes a modifier for the enemy. Whereas if this had been some other kind of encounter, this would have just been one automatic damage to me, uh, regardless of how the encounter went. So nice, we get to show you some combat right off the bat. But don't forget, I still have my second action after this. All right, it's a lady with a shotgun versus a giant python. And by the way, I should have mentioned that before you move, you choose what you have equipped. You can have up to two hand items equipped. I just have uh, one for my sawn-off shotgun and one piece of armor equipped. Uh, you have to choose that before you go because uh, if you get into a fight, you have to deal with what you already have to hand. But since this is all I have, it wasn't really a choice. So first in combat, you check enemy traits. And this is a cruddy one for us because this scrub python has ambush, which means he's going to attack us very, very early before we get a chance to get a shot at him. Okay, and then we're going to choose one weapon to attack with. And we can either do a ranged weapon, which has a reticle right here, or a melee weapon, which has a spiked knuckles symbol like the python has. And that basically determines initiative. Range attacks go off before melee attacks. But that's where ambush is annoying because he's going to attack me before I get to do anything else. So my shotgun won't let me hit him any earlier. Now you can also always choose to just fight with your bare hands. And that's what I'm going to do in this case because uh, as you'll see in a second, this scrub python I think is a little bit beyond my means. And I don't want to waste one of my three ammo shooting my shotgun if I'm just going to miss him. So then we go into the five steps of combat. We have the engagement step where ambush or any other engagement effects resolve. We have range attacks, the advanced step, which again is just for effects that say advance, melee attacks, and then resolution. And here's the key thing about combat, which I think is great. It is one round and done. They ride away from you, you ride away from them, uh, somebody escapes. 
And here's why I decided not to use my shotgun. This guy's got three life. So if I couldn't do at least three damage, he would escape and I would have wasted my ammo. But look at his special ability. If I'm on a scrub space, which I am, this enemy gains plus two dice and I gain an additional gear card for defeating it. This is a uh, reward right here, a gear card, an item. So because we're in the scrub forest, he has more to offer me, but my chance of doing five damage, even with a shotgun, ah, I don't think it's great. So we go to the engagement phase, and because the python has ambush, he just jumps all over my face. Uh, this is his attack value, three green dice. And don't forget, he's doing two extra damage. This is going to be painful. So for enemies, you're mostly just looking for blasts, which is how much damage they do. Some of them will also have a special effect off of the spade roll. In the scrub python, though, his special effect is just dealing one damage. So I've taken five damage. Out of my seven max, if I had taken seven, I would have been unconscious. Now, luckily, I have a vest. It says you may break this card to prevent up to two damage. So that'll bring it down to three. And breaking a card, you'll see that the vest is kind of on this more brownish side. That means flipping it to its white side. It now has a weaker effect. I can discard this card permanently to prevent one damage. And it adds this little repair value here, too. Now, Zoe Shaw is a mechanic, so she's great at repairing things. So I should be able to fix that vest up pretty easily. But now I add three damage out of seven to my health. I'll try to heal with my med kit later. And now we skip through range combat. We skip through advance. We don't have anything to do with them. And we go right to melee. And if you attack in melee, you use your blade skill plus your weapons bonus. If you attack in range, you use your gun skill. So if I had shot with my sawed-off shotgun, I would have done two white dice, two green dice, and could have dealt extra damage if I rolled a spade. But as it is, I'm just punching with my uh, blade skill of two white dice and got nothing. I feel pretty happy with my decision not to waste a bullet. So the scrub python squeezes me for a bit and then uh, scrabbles off for easier prey. I'm hurt, my vest is damaged, but we'll survive. So now I get to my second action. I can't move again. I could camp to uh, heal myself and fix my vest. I could explore to get more resources. I'm not in a city, but I'm gonna go ahead and do the plot action since I have reached the first space on my little quest to deal with the Merchant Cartel and Mutants. And we check the guide for plot token number one. It says C15 in the Book of Tales. And I can remove this. And let's not forget, perhaps most important, I just bought myself two more rounds. You reach Maleburn, a place ruled by ruthless female gangs with hardly any petrol left in your tank. This is the westernmost outpost, which the cartel can still consider friendly. However, the situation might change this very day. You can see smoke and hear gunshots coming from afar. The ruined city is besieged by mutants. Its dwellers are fiercely fighting for every building and square. Okay, and then it tells me to find two specific encounter cards for the uh, two sides misconflict. Alice's Outcast, the mutants, and the Maleburn Beauties. And I get a choice. I can side with the beauties and help them defend the city, side with the mutants and help them attack the gang, be a scout and watch later. And if I was a slasher, I could just charge in and kill everybody, it seems like. Now, in the last game I played of this in the north, I kind of went with the corporate line and pushed this up. So let's try something different and help out the mutants against the gangs. You drive your vehicle into the thick of battle and start ramming the defenders. Despite your efforts, the women counterattack and soon you're forced to fight side by side with the mutants. All right, so I'm moving the dominance marker down one. And at the end of the round in which it gets to three or lower, I'm going to have an event I have to resolve. Okay, but that means we're going into combat with the male burn beauties. And it says if you attack using a ranged weapon, this enemy rolls the same dice as your weapon when attacking, and that just means one extra damage. So man, if I use my shotgun, they'll get stronger. But they've got four life, and I want to take them down. So in this combat, we skip the engagement step. We go right to range attack, and I will use my shotgun. I have to spend one ammo. And I get my gun skill, one green and one white, as well as a son of shotgun, also with a white and a green. And for each spade I roll, I do two damage, which is awesome. But if I roll at least one, I've busted my shotgun and I'll have to fix it later. And Zoe's ability maybe could come into play now. It says once per turn, you may re-roll a broken gear you obtained. So some of the dice have that broken gear symbol and break a weapon automatically. Although I think, yes, that's only on blue and red dice. So that won't come into play here. All right, I need four damage. Come on. Oh man, I got so close. Three, and there is mitigation later in the game, but I haven't gotten any of it yet. Ugh. That means the beauties are doing a green and a red, plus the white and green from my shotgun. This might hurt a bit. Okay, it's not too bad. Uh, one, two, three with their spade ability. Oh my gosh, that's one away from defeat. I could throw away my vest to cancel one of the damage, but I'd rather fix it. So yeah, we'll just go to six out of seven. Back to the entry. You haven't broken the lines of the defenders. You must retreat. The glow of burning male burn lights your way for many hours. It's hard to say what will be the outcome of the conflict in this area. Nothing happens. No matter the combat result, discard both wasteland cards placed next to the board. Ah, darn it. That was a bummer of a first result. 
But hey, next round, I guess I can cruise over to Alice Offspring, where the mutants came from. At least they know I'm on their side, right? And speaking of next round, we didn't do this at the beginning of round one, but we do it at the beginning of every other round. We're down to three time. So for my actions this turn, I don't necessarily have to rush immediately to the next plot point. I have a little bit of time, and I'm really worried that I'm so close to being defeated. I can take a camp action to heal myself with my medicine. But first, I'd love to get more medicine. Now, I'm taking a chance here because I'm going to do an explore action, which means I can flip over these explore cards and try to find some resources for myself. But if I take one damage, I'll be knocked unconscious. And if you get a second one of these, you lose the game. Well, let's go for it. I've got a two exploration value. And what that means is I can flip up to two cards. And let's go and flip the first one. And what you do is you find your terrain type. We're still on scrub. This is the resource or reward you find. In this case, one experience. Experience moves this little tracker down. Whenever you reach a multiple of three, you get to upgrade your character. But this would make me draw and resolve a Wasteland card, which I am 99% sure would kill me. So let's uh, flip again. That's what my two exploration value means. I can flip a second card completely covering the first card. Doesn't exist anymore. Ooh, much better. Okay. Uh, one medicine, one gasoline. I do have to break a chosen gear card, but I can fix things easily, so I'm okay with that. Now, I could, once per explore, spend one of the two gasoline from my bike to basically drive around looking for something better and get a third draw, but I'm happy with this. Although, sadly, my bike is at full gas capacity, so the third gas is wasted. Remember, in that exploration, my shotgun got broken. And now for my second action of the turn, let's show you the camp action. You've seen basically all of the core actions, except for the city action. Like I said, it's a streamlined game. So when you camp, first of all, you can spend as much medicine as you want. For each medicine spent, you can either heal three damage or one radiation if you've gotten it. So I'll spend both of these and be back in action, baby. And then additionally, you look at your character's repair value. Mine is super high for a mechanic, four. Now let's see repair broken gear cards. Each gear shows how many of your repair points it costs. So this is great with my vest and my shotgun. Boom, boom, both fully repaired. Thank you, mechanic. Now, your vehicle can also take damage, usually from moving, and if it reaches its chassis value here, your vehicle becomes wrecked, and if that happens twice, once again, you lose the game. And for each of your repair points you spend on your vehicle, you can remove one of those damage, but I got my shotgun and my vest, I'm good to go. So a quick second round, like I said, you don't draw encounters except when you move. But speaking of moving, now that I'm all repaired up, let's try to get to Alice Offsprings, which is a city, so I can show you the city action, maybe. Remember, my bike has five movement, and I can discard gasoline to get up to eight. So the shortest path would be two on the mountains, zero, 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 four, five, six, and this counts as scrub, seven, eight. So that's the shortest path, but I guess it might be the only path that uh, I want to take. Now, if I wanted to be safer and avoid getting radiation and a threat token and contaminated wounds... I guess I could go like two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then I could move uh, next round as well to finally get in there. But my time's getting a little bit short. I don't want to chance it. So two, that's all three, four, five, six. And again, the city shows that it's a scrub land, seven, eight. That costs one of my gasoline to give my bike plus three movement points. And I tell you what, that was an ugly trip. I got a radiation here and a contaminated wound here and one threat. Now, for radiation, you fill in these little resilience spaces from left to right. So the first one doesn't actually hurt you at all, but the second one takes away one die from every test you do. Terrible. And the third one means you can't heal damage until you heal the radiation, which, remember, you can do with one medicine or in a city, as you'll see. As for contaminated wounds, they're not as bad as radiation. The key thing with them is they still only count as one wound out of my seven, but when I want to heal that, the first heal will only flip it, and the second will take it away. So it's kind of, like, doubly difficult to get rid of. How about my token? Ah, this is the same side. It is an immediate one. I have to lose one resource of my choice. I have two ammo and one gas. I need the gas to keep going fast, so I guess I'll lose the ammo. And let's see what friend I met on my dangerous travels. Encounter G. This is a cool thing where they have these cards that will trigger unique encounters that you might or might not see in your plays. But looking at this scenario, only A, B, and E are in play. So we just discard this card and draw again. Instead, we're fighting the turkey tribe. Are they riding... Like, armored turkeys? <laughs> so let's see, they have, ooh, a very powerful melee attack, four life, but I can get experience and a gear card if I can defeat them. And let's see, if they get a spade, this enemy deals X damage. X is the number of enemy cards on all Wasteland discard piles. Well, unfortunately, for my last encounter, that is two, so yikes, that'll do two damage. Maybe I can try to shoot them with my shotgun with my last bullet before they reach me. Yeah, let's try it out. I want to shoot them before they hit me. All right, come on, come on. I could really use a good roll this time. Need four damage. That looks good. That looks good. Yes! Ooh, that's two. The shotgun adds two more. Five. It will break my shotgun, but I don't care. I just broke it on their faces. I'm having some turkey tonight. So I gain one experience, one third of the way toward upgrading. 
So I gain one experience, one third of the way toward upgrading, and a gear card, which always comes in broken. In this case, ooh, a boomerang. Oh, requires no ammo to fire? Oh, but when attacking, use your blade skill, and then discard this card. I'm assuming that the fixed side, yeah, breaks when you use it. Ooh, but if you roll a spade, you don't break it. I mean, it's kind of better than my shotgun, kind of worse. I'm not that much worse at blades than I am at guns, so I'll probably uh, start using that. But for now, I can just go into my bike, which can hold up to four gear cards. And I can switch it out for my shotgun basically at any time, except when you move, you have to pick it before you start moving. But actually, what am I talking about? I don't even have any ammo, so clearly I'm going to put the boomerang there for now. All right, now I'm in Alice Offspring, and let's see. Wow, that is a long trek around to get to the next spot. So let's uh, see what plot point two has to offer me. I might do a city action before I drive the next turn. My time's coming back. You spend some time in Alice Offsprings trying to understand the moods of the inhabitants of this pirate city. It's obvious that the free mutants from the other side of the Great Divide made a deal with the mutated Corsairs, and the city is the most important transit point for the League's forces in the south. Okay, so we check the Outback Chronicles. If Malburn was saved, nope. If Malburn fell, these are things we would have written down based on our results. So we just go to 105. It seems the mutant offensive isn't going as planned. However, lack of news about the outcome of the Battle of Malburn might be beneficial. Okay, I can spread rumors about the victory of the mutants, spread rumors about the defeat of the mutants, discreetly look for a way to make the crossing to the west, or, ooh, if I'm the mechanic, it's easy to find a broken ship to a port city, offer to help with the repairs in exchange for transport. Oh man, if I can just take a boat across the Great Divide, that'll make things a billion times easier. Let's definitely do that one. All right, so that choice says test tech two, and that means exactly what you might imagine. I'm gonna roll my tech dice, two green, very good. And I have to get two successes, which only counts the little explosions in this case. The spade is just a miss. All right, come on. Yes! You easily deal with the old engine of this cutter. Looks like mutants don't quite catch what motor oil is for. You fix the ship in your own crossing west at the same time, but by doing so, you also support the mutant army. All right, well, I guess that worked out. Move the dominance marker one space down the track, Place your knife figure on space 36 and lose all remaining actions. Glad that was the end of my turn anyway. All right, so here we are. It's not as close as I would have hoped, but it's still closer than I was. Now, the important thing is the faction tracker has gone down to three, which means at the end of the round, which is right now since my actions got lost, although I didn't have any left anyway, we're going to read the special result for this scenario. All right, this one says perform a free regain consciousness action. That would only matter if I'd been knocked unconscious, but I wasn't. As you travel further west, you hear more and more alarming gossip about the leader of the Free Mutants League from Carcassville. It's during one of your stops on the way when you encounter a group of mutants in a ruined motel. They're hanging propaganda posters stating, Golfer is coming, and feature a proud portrait of a giant mutant. Oh man, I want this guy to be a bad guy too. I want to help the good guys. So let's see, I can approach them and tear one poster off the wall. I can watch from the shadows, then leave, or I can ask for a few posters and offer your help in hanging them. Well, <laughs> I guess I'm in for a penny and for a pound. Let's go ahead and do the uh, helpful mutant one. And first, the mutants look at you with distrust. You're a normie, after all. Somehow, you manage to persuade them that you'll hang some of the posters on your way west. Tempted by the vision of a quick break from this boring work, the agitators throw a few packs of the propaganda crap into your trunk and share their supplies with you. As you resume your travels, you wonder where the creature from the poster got its nickname from. One thing is sure, given your luck, sooner or later you'll meet this player. Okay, so I gain one resource of my choice. Awesome, definitely gonna be ammo so I can shoot my dang gun again. Oh, wait, wait, I have a boomerang. So maybe, uh, maybe I'll get medicine for that radiation. Then I take card number nine from the special deck. These are in order and you always take them as directed. Place it face up next to the plot sheet. This is Golfer, the general of the Free Mutants Army and the mastermind behind the operation directed against New Sydney. All right. Oh, see, I knew it was something innocuous. He just likes to play little games like golf. With human heads. Awesome. I'm glad I'm supporting this guy. Great. And all right, we're into the next round, down to three time again. All right, and let's see. Do I want to go right on the road? If I went through the outback, I want to get it radiated again. That'd be two, four, six. And then I guess that's desert, so that'd be seven. So I'd need to use my gas, but I can make it there without anything negative. But, you know, maybe for this turn, I'll get my boomerang in working order and heal my radiation and take a little time. So let's first explore. I can draw up the two cards. And I'm on desert, which would get me medicine, but place a permanent danger marker on my space, which wouldn't be too bad. Um, I guess I could use the medicine. Yeah, you know what? I guess that's fine. Then for my second action, I'll camp. I'm just going to spend one medicine. I don't need to heal the uh, corrupted wound yet. I'll get rid of my radiation. But the main thing is I'm going to flip my boomerang to working order, and I might as well flip my shotgun too, because they both have a two repair value. I know, they're actually each one-handed, so I can just say I have them both equipped for now. All right, quick little resting turn before we advance the plot again. 
So let's spend the last fuel for my bike to get eight movement. And I'll go, like I said, two, four, six, seven. No negative tokens this time since I left that space, but we've got some seekers coming after us. Okay, so they do attack in the range phase, just like us. This enemy gains X additional white dice. X is the total number of gear cards you have. Are you joking with me? And so I've got three gear. Wow, these guys are tough. Oh, look, engagement. I can discard any number of gear cards, basically uh, dissuade them from attacking me. But I get ooh, two experience and I'll level up if I kill them. But they do two damage on a spade. Oh, my gosh. All right, all right, all right. Well, let's try to take them down. So with no ammo, it's going to be all about my trusty boomerang here. I'm not going to discard any gear cards. I'm not afraid of you guys. So remember, boomerang uses blades, even though it's a ranged weapon. So I'm still rolling two white and two green. I need four damage. Come on. Ah, not enough. And these guys have three whites for my gear cards, plus one green. Please don't hurt me too much. Oof, four. I'll cancel two of it with my vest. It'll just take two damage overall. Dang it, dang it, dang it. I really wanted that upgrade. But it's okay, we're still alive. Although, man, I'm really wishing I'd taken a city action when I was back in the city. I could have uh, tried to buy some more stuff. But uh, whatever, let's go ahead and do our next plot. Oh, and I can't forget, I have to break my stupid boomerang. No! In the region of the Outback, where you've just arrived, one can find hundreds of similar places. Dugouts is actually a remnant of a mine from before the Scourge. The only thing left today is a deep crater with characteristic steps leading down a huge hole and a few worked drilled wells that make this place an important strategic point. The inhabited parts of the mine have been taken over by mutants who have started expanding the town. Now tens of huts are being raised on rock shelves and in the night campfires mark wide round edges of each floor of the settlement. And so I can either help the settlers organize themselves or sabotage their traffic system. If I was the stalker, I could do something else to the water pumps. So I'm assuming since this is west of the Divide, these are the mutants again, so I guess I'll help them. You dish out precious supplies among the mutants. Oh, wait, they wanted my supplies? <laughs> I only have one medicine. Discard any number. Oh, at least two will do something. Nope. Uh, you had good intentions, but in the end, you didn't help the local community in any tangible way. The mutants have to survive on their own. Sorry, dudes. Now we're going down to round three again, which I think gives me time to explore and camp again. I want to uh, heal my damage and repair my boomerang and my vest. All right, so first one is just ammo. And there's no negative? Maybe that's good enough? Ah, but I'd rather have medicine or fuel since I already have the boomerang. Okay, here we go. Fuel or ammo, but I take one damage. Well, I'll still do it. <laughs> I'm saying I'll still do it as though I have a choice, so here is my fuel. And second action, I'm going to camp. That actually works out pretty well, because I can heal those three wounds, and I can just ignore the contaminated wound. And then we'll get our boomerang and vest in working order again. Okay, we're getting close to crunch time again. Let's go. I'm glad I got the fuel, though, so let's see. One... Uh, that's a zero for a road, so two total, four total, five total. Ooh, and that's a road as well. It counts as one, so awesome. And I only went through one threat. Not too bad. Let's see, my bike will take two damage if I have a regular encounter, or the enemy will gain armor piercing. I won't be able to use my vest if I have a uh, enemy encounter. Hmm. Oh, but cool, we got one of the unique ones for the scenario. Let's see what happens. And since I didn't have a combat encounter, I do have my bike half damaged here. Traveling the road to ruin, you encounter a friend from the good old days when going through the Badlands was motivated by your adventurous spirit, not a tedious duty. Oh, this is so cool. I get a different one based on who I am. You encounter Dr. Fang, an old friend from New Sydney who, just like you, had his own surgery. He says that the mercenary gang started taking over poorer districts of the metropolis and the cartel allowed them to treat the inhabitants with increasing brutality. Fang had to flee the city when he helped a sick mutant. Hey, I can silence Fang. Spreading such rumors is no good for the cause, but I'm not going to do that because I'm on the mutant side right now. I can just recollect good old times, or I can suggest mutants from the West will need medical expertise. Yeah, it seems good to me. It's painful to see how the most valuable people have to run away from brute force and hired muscle of the merchant cartel, but there's nothing you can do about that. You suggest to your companion that the free mutants will surely value his work more than his previous employers and explain how to reach Carcassville. The mutants have just gained a powerful ally, though you don't like the sinister look in Dr. Fegg's eyes. What does that mean? But anyway, I get a medicine, love that, and Dominance Marker is down to the two space, although there are no other special events that trigger, uh, except for that one on the three space. Well, sweet, that was great. Nothing negative happened at all. Um, let's go ahead and do the plot right away. That gets our time up to four. It takes more than a couple hours to locate the place the cartel men told you about. Finally, you find a ruined military harbor full of huge rusted warships bristling with cannons. They look much more powerful than the pirate fleet from Alice Offsprings, and instead of proper names, they have faded numbers on their hulls. You wonder why you were told to come here? 
Now let's see, I can check if anything actually works in this watery junkyard. Tag the entrance to the base with paint. Or if I'm the mechanic, ooh, search for ground defense systems and try to turn them on, yes. You're the cartel's technical ace for a reason. The ships are wrecked, but the ground defense system look good. One thing is particularly promising, a rocket battery in the western part of the harbor and its control set are hidden in a bunker close by. You activate the IFF system and change its settings. All right, so I could uh, mark the cartel as friend and mutants as foe, or the opposite, or self-destructed. Well, let's go all in and say the cartel are the foes. All right, we got another tech test. Two green again. Oh, and a total failure. You think you've managed to program the IFF systems correctly? <laughs> yeah, sure I did. You can hear the missiles moving into combat positions, and the radar panel starts to beep monotonously. Ah, move the marker up one. So yeah, clearly I got that backwards. Okay, so it goes. We're going down to three. No, the next place is actually really close. Oh, oh, wait, never mind. I have to go around the craters. So that would be zero, one, two, three, four. No, just four. Okay, so I can do that easily. All right, so let's keep on rushing things a bit. I shouldn't have to repair my bike because I'm just going to get a corrupted wound here. So that's again, zero, one, two, three, four, zero, zero. Oh my gosh, another tough guy. Um, oh no, all spades you obtain in this combat are considered blanks. Order of the Flame. They have three dice, they attack in range, four life. They deal two damage on that, but I get two experience and level up if I kill them. Boomerang, I'm down! Okay, I don't think I have very good chances here. What? Yes, yes, oh my gosh. Look, a white's only roll a hit half the time, and then they only have one at double side. That was amazing. Now, of course, my boomerang does break, and they get to shoot me back. Nothing I can do about that. But I've got my vest, not too worried. Oh my gosh. So I'll prevent two of that four damage. I'm definitely in a bit of a bad way. But on the positive, they give me a medicine, so I'll be able to heal pretty quickly and two experience, yes. So if this has reached a three, you'll see it's shaded differently, so I'm going to level up. It either happens at the end of the turn automatically or when I take a camp action. You know what? I know I'm on the plot thing, but I don't want to have a fight when I'm not prepared. So let's uh, do that camp action for my second one. My bike is damaged. Do I want to maybe not repair one of these? Ah, but I think I need these. I'm going to still repair the vest and the boomerang. And then one of these, we'll get rid of both of those and flip this. Could spend the other one. Yeah, let's just spend the other one and get rid of everything. All right, so I'm in a good spot as long as I don't crash my car. And now I get to upgrade. Now, each character has four unique cards, and it's actually more than four because uh, two of them are double-sided, and then two of them are unique gear, so it's really six upgrades. There's also six generic ones, but what's the fun in that? So I can get Gas Burner. Spend one gasoline to deal two damage to your enemy once per combat. That's amazing, because it's in the advanced phase after I roll my range attacks. So I only need to use it if I didn't defeat them normally. Okay, or Master Tinker. Gain one repair. When performing the camp action, instead of using your repair, you can discard a malfunction card from a vehicle on your space. Malfunction cards are the ones where if you get two on your vehicle, you lose the game. But I don't think I need that. Okay, one of a kind. When you gain this card, attach it to any gear card you own. Immediately flip this card to its working side. For you, its repair cost is always two. Uh, some things have an X repair cost, which means you can only repair them at a city. So this would be pretty amazing if I had that. But clearly I don't. And also this one, like some cards, is locked behind a certain skill level. So I would need to have six experience to get this. Another option, Technical Knack. When you draw a broken gear card as a reward, you may flip that gear card to its working side. I mean, I can already repair stuff, right? Okay, Servo Arm I can't get yet, but when attacking you gain one white die and it can defend me from damage. That's pretty awesome. Ooh, or Junk Gun. It's unlikely for it to break, even from the blue die. That's what the Ignore 1 symbol you obtained. And uh, if I roll a spade, I deal one damage. I may spend ammo to deal additional damage, but I don't have enough ammo right now. See, so, yeah, I think in these circumstances, the choice is pretty clear. Gas Burner for some extra damage. All right, time takes down to two, but not a problem because my first action is going to be doing the second to last plot. Either you're too far south or your superiors in New Sydney really suck at recon. You find yourself in Arid Inn, a place looking like a mix of a summer resort and a biker rally. Mutants are lying on the beach close to a building complex that decades ago used to be a logistics center or a huge shopping mall. <laughs> While they're sunbathing and sipping neon drinks from dirty mugs, travelers, gang members, and pioneers are crowded in a few joints and bars. Here, no one thinks about the war being fought on the other side of the continent. All right, so we're not the slasher, so we need to go to space one to three, where the uh, dominance marker is, page three. This might be the last opportunity to relax, and considering that the mutants see you as one of their own, you might as well take it. You reach for a pink drink and get ready to have some fun. Then your vision gets blurry. Okay, so I'm going to test aid, and I could spend medicine. I don't have any. Get an extra bullet. Ah, oh, well. Aid is not my strong suit. I don't think this is going to... What? Yes! The pink drink was rather strong, but in the morning, you're still standing. No mean feat seeing the people around you. You've shown the mutants that normies can hold their own. 
So I gain one experience, cool. Oh, I heal all damage. Well, that would have been great before I spent my medicine. I move the dominance marker one space down or up, so I guess I'll move it down. And all right, for my second action, I have a bit of time. I'm going to go exploring. First card is just a gear. Oh, it seems pretty good. Yeah, let's keep it. Oh, hey, it's a, another vest, which might seem like a waste, but when I get to the city, I can sell this for two money worth to get more resources or other items, so I don't mind that at all. All right, here we go. We're going to go to Carcassville in the end of the journey. Oh, but oof, there's a lot of crap in my way. <laughs> okay, so that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it would cost me my one gas that I was going to use for my gas burner. But it's okay. I can uh, sell stuff when I get to the city. So let's go ahead and spend it. And I'm taking one of the green wounds, one radiation, but one won't hurt me, and then making it in there. Oh, but first I got to fight a steel dragonfly? What the heck? This enemy ignores your attacks unless you obtain at least one spade. Whoa. And she deals a little extra damage. Three dice. I can get some experience and gear if I kill her. Let's try it. And I don't have any gasoline for the gas burner. I just spent it. So I just need a really great, great, great boomerang roll. Nope. I mean, it was pretty good, but uh, unfortunately I didn't get a spade. So the boomerang is broken. And she attacks me in melee. Okay, four. I'll break my vest, bring it down to two. Man, I know the mechanic is not a huge combat character, but this has not been her day. The last time I did this intro scenario, once I did the final plot token, it basically went to epic showdown time, which makes me think I should slow down a bit since I have a couple turns to go and spend my second action doing a city action. You haven't seen that yet. So the city action has a few options. You can heal yourself one radiation up to four damage. You can repair your car up to three. You can flip one of your gear cards to working side, no matter how hard it is to flip. Or you can go buying for up to three items in the stalls. Now I can easily fix my own stuff with a camp action later. So let's first go to the quack. And this is great. Four healing will get rid of all of that. And uh, I'll get rid of my radiation. And then let's secondly go to the stalls. and be able to buy and sell resources and items. And let's see what I got. Med Injector. Discard any time to heal three or five if it's flipped and repaired. Ooh, Pump Action Shotgun sounds good. Uh, it's a red on its broken side, but a red and a white on its fixed size. Does use two hands. And if your enemy has a melee attack, deals three, although it's a miss otherwise on the spade. And then Cricket Pads. That's just another armor that can prevent up to two damage. Oh, but it's discarded either way. Interesting. All right, the only thing I'm at all interested in is a pump action shotgun. I can sell my sawn off. I can sell one of my vests. They're worth their barter value, one and two, which would get me the shotgun in a broken state. And then I'm going to also sell my vest. And for each extra barter point you have, you can get one resource. And I'm sort of prepping here for one epic showdown. So I'm going to get one ammo to fire my shotgun and one gasoline to use my gas burner for two extra damage if I need to. All right, so that was the end of that round. Pretty simple. Let's see, my first and second action this round will just be to camp and repair my stuff. And although I'm sure it won't matter, I'll also have enough left to repair my uh, bike. All right, and then we go into the final round. No need to waste time. Well, I guess it's not the final round because I'm doing the final plot at Carcassville. You finally reach the true mutant capital, Carcassville. Everything around here reminds you that you're just an ordinary human. From the dank air of the city erected on platforms floating on mangrove swamps to its weird inhabitants. Oh, we get a free camp action. Don't need that. Okay, and then if special card number nine is in the game, it is. That was Gulfer, the guy we uh, heard about. You know exactly who to meet. You walk straight to the Carcassville Stadium, a cleared area in the jungle. Finding the general of the Free Mutants Offensive isn't hard. He's the toughest there is, after all. The mutant leader is monstrous. You can see from afar his bald head sticking out above the trees. The beast takes a swing with a street lantern ripped from a highway shoulder and hits a wrecked field kitchen, shouting, For! It flies in a wide arc, spitting fire, and lands a few dozen meters away. All right, now we resolve the proper entry. Depending on the position of the dominance marker, it's on the two space. If we were the stalker and poisoned the well, something else would have happened. You stand face to face with Golfer. The giant looks at you curiously. You, a normal human. Want to help my mutant sisters and brothers in the just fight for their rights in the waste? Asked Golfer in a booming voice, surprising you with his eloquence. You know full well that only by choosing your words wisely and keeping a cool head, you'll come out of this one alive. Okay, you unconditionally join the free mutant's cause and betray the cartel, or you persuade Golfer it's not the best moment to attack. I guess I'll unconditionally join them. Here and now, it's been your destination all along. You offer your full support to the mutant's cause and tell Golfer all the secrets about new city defenses and weak points. He acknowledges your merits. 
From now on, you're the honorary citizen of Carcassville, probably the only non-mutated human to hold this title. Not much later, the final offensive to the east of the Great Divide starts, and you're on Highway 1 yet again. I oh, know, no big battle, interesting. <laughs> When you started your journey west from New Sydney along the remnants of Highway 1, you had no idea how local problems might change the ways as you know it. But on the other hand, that's what a ride through the outback truly is. Fickle, amazing, and sometimes leading to ruin. You left New City as one of the cartel enforcers, but returned from your journey defending mutant rights in the south. Hand in hand with non-humans, met and allied under golfers' leadership, you bring new order to the waste. The order making everyone equal, no matter their origins or stature. Your journey has turned out to be the road to ruin of the established order based on exploitation and domination. Your knight wins. But you know what? I promised a boss battle. Let's have one. Let's pretend that I decided to just shoot Golfer in the face with my shotgun. Let's see how that goes. Now, he's got 15 life, which is clearly impossible. But based on the allegiance and how many things you've done, that would be lower. Uh, but let's see how much we can do. I'm doing my uh, new pump action shotgun. So that's white and green from my gun skill, white and red from the shotgun itself. Boom! Oh my gosh, uh, so that is six damage. I wish I'd gotten a spade. There would have been three more since he's a melee fighter. And then I'd use my gas burner as well, get to eight damage. I bet that would have been enough if I had been allied with the cartel instead. Of course, in this case, I wasn't, so he would just knock off my head potentially. Ah, three damage, I survived that. So we just uh, part as amicable friends after I shot him full of lead. <laughs> But there you go, that was Waste Nights, just one of the way the two intro missions can end. Uh, lots of variants here. And again, this mission is much shorter and much more kind of a time-dependent rush than most other ones, so don't judge the entire game based on this. Instead, I suggest you check out the review that just popped up and hear my full thoughts on the game for solo and co-op. Good gaming, everybody, and I'll see you at the next stop.